Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Washington Memorial Chapel. We're so pleased that you have joined us today. If this is your first time worshiping with us, a guest card just like this can be found in the back of each pew. So please complete that card. And when you've done filling it out, give it to an usher or place it in the collection plate because we would love to follow up with you to see how we might further serve you here at the chapel. This is another day where the heat index is going up. So as we've said, as a church community, let's check on each other. Make sure if you have uh, friends that nearby that uh, live alone uh, or just want somebody to check in on them, please remember to do that to make sure that everyone is okay. The Summer Caroline concert continues out in our beautiful grove this coming week on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Hunter Chase of Washington, D.C. will perform. Hunter last played here in 2015, so we are pleased to welcome him back. It is becoming a tradition that our Cabin Shop Cafe creates a special cold drink in honor of our guest Carolinia. And we look forward to doing that for Hunter this week. So bring your chairs and join us. The Cabin Shop Cafe will also be serving a full menu, including an ice cream sundae bar for your enjoyment. The Outreach Committee continues to collect food donations on the first weekend of every month. The collection this month will be delivered to the Upper Marion Area Community Cover. We don't have to remind you that the need in our community is great, so both food and monetary donations are welcome. Please check Friday's newsletter for details on what food items are acceptable and where to send your check. Most importantly, we want to ask you to keep our families that we serve in your prayers. Coming up this week on Thursday, August the 11th at 6 p.m., the Washington Memorial, Memorial Heritage continues with this monthly series, Lead Like George, where the leadership traits of George Washington and his contemporaries are explored. This is a special one this week. It features an exclusive author event with renowned writer and historian William Larry Kidder. Mr. Kidder will discuss his critically acclaimed book, 10 Crucial Days, Washington's Victory, Vision for Victory Unfolds. You can register by click, clicking on the link in the Friday newsletter. So please plan to come. This series really has been extraordinary and a true opportunity to learn how we can all apply leadership lessons of great leaders like Washington to our own lives. Again, welcome to Washington Memorial Chapel.
the Gentile shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Let us humbly kneel and confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O merciful Father, for his sake, that we may ever hereafter live godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant us absolution and remission of all our sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips. Now shall show forth thy prayers. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, let the whole earth stand in awe of him. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, and with righteousness to judge the world, and the peoples with his truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Please be seated. We will read the appointed psalm by whole verse. The Lord is king, let the people tremble. He is enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth shake. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God, and worship him upon his holy hill, for the Lord our God is the Holy One. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.
The first lesson is a reading from the book of Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Here endeth the reading. We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee, cherubim and seraphim, continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabbath, heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee. The Father of an infinite majesty, the true and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon me to deliver man, thou didst humble thyself to be born of a virgin. When thou hast overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make, Make them, them to be numbered, numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud, a voice that came that said, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. 
Here endeth the reading. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers, and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham, that he, that he would, would give us, that we, that we being delivered, delivered out of the hand, hand of our enemies, enemies might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him, all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Amen. Day by day we magnify thee. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, let thy mercy be upon us. O Lord, in thee have I trusted. O God, who on the holy mount revealed to chosen witnesses thy well-beloved Son, wonderfully transfigured in raiment white and glistening, mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may by faith behold the King in his beauty, who with thee, O Father, and thee, O Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom. Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, 
through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that we, being ordered by thy governance, may do always what is righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We gather in the name of the one God whom we know as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, you can tell that it's August in Montgomery County. The sidewalks are sizzling hot. You walk outside, the humidity hits you like a wet blanket. At the end of Wednesday night carillon concerts, the nightly insect chorus starts up and they shout in the churchyard trees. When we walk out of the cabin shop, it is deafening. Back to school shopping destinations like Kohl's and Home Goods are filled with college students arguing with their mothers about why they really need that big comfy chair for their dorm room. I just want to walk up to them and say, honey, it's not going to fit. Let their parents have that argument with them. Ah, uh, August in Montgomery County. So, since it is August, you might ask, because I know I certainly did, why am I preaching on a gospel text about the Transfiguration? We usually hear this on the last Sunday of Epiphany as we prepare for the season of Lent. What's the deal? Well, I'm glad you asked. Even if you didn't, I will tell you. It is because the Feast of the Transfiguration is not actually in February, when Epiphany ends. It is actually August 6th. Who knew? Well, evidently Father Tommy did. And face it, no matter how often you hear it, the Transfiguration narrative is a great story. There is always something new to think about. It's an important story, too. We know this because it appears in all three of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It takes place right after Peter identifies Jesus as the Messiah, and Jesus tells the disciples that he is headed to Jerusalem and will suffer and die there. Now, while the accounts in all three Gospels have the same basic details, the writer of Luke adds even more theological aspects to the story. Now, Luke was not a witness to the event. None of the gospel writers were. But those additional touches that Luke adds make this account of the Transfiguration so rich. Luke tells us that right after Jesus told the disciples what to expect in the future, he took Peter, James, and John up the mountain with him to pray. Now, both the mountain, going up the mountain, and the fact that Jesus was going to go pray there are significant. Luke's audience of Jewish Christians would know that Jesus' times of prayer often involve significant encounters with God. And mountains often feature as places of special revelation in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, for instance, after Elijah's run-in with the priests of Baal, where he, tried, he challenges them to a barbecue and wins and then kills them all, he's ready to run away, give up, and die. But then on this mountain, he has an encounter with God. In today's first lesson, 
We heard about Moses and his encounters with God on the mountain. And when he came down from that mountain, Moses' face was glowing with the remembered radiance of his encounter with God. So mountains are a big deal. Now, the transfiguration story in Luke parallels the story of Moses in so many ways, which when I teach this in class, believe me, I will go over in excruciating detail and there will be a test. I will spare you. Suffice it to say that Luke uses the familiar story of Moses on the mountain to underscore the fact that Jesus has an even more important role to play in the history of God's activity with God's people. But before we get to that, let's talk for a minute about the disciples. Now, we know that Peter, James, and John were Jesus' closest followers. So it was not unusual for Jesus to take his inner circle with him when he went off for some time of prayer and reflection. So when Jesus announced his plans, the three disciples packed their sandwiches, they put on their hiking boots, and they were expecting a quiet afternoon up the mountain, some prayer, maybe a little nap in the sunshine before heading back down the mountain to rejoin the rest of the disciples. So when they arrived at their destination, Jesus settled down to pray, and the disciples did too for a little while. But it was hot, and it had been a long climb. Hiking boots were pinching a little bit. So they settled back against the rocks, and they were just about nodding off when something happened that snapped them right back into full alert mode. Jesus was still there, but he looked different. He was glowing. And he was not by himself. Moses and Elijah were there too. And the light, the light was incredible. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were bathed in this brilliant, glorious light. Now, the Jewish people expected that Moses and the prophet Elijah would return to usher in the messianic age. They didn't know when it was going to happen. So the fact that the disciples saw Moses and Elijah on the mountaintop talking with Jesus, surrounded by this glorious, dazzling display of heaven, could only mean one thing. Jesus was the Messiah, sent by God to save God's people, and the new age was beginning. Luke reinforces that message by telling us that Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were talking about Jesus' exodus to Jerusalem and the cross. And yes, the word exodus is the Greek word that is used in the text. And that's significant. As any one of my Bible 100 students can or should be able to tell you, we use the word exodus to describe the event when Moses led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt into the freedom of the promised land. By using that word, Exodus, in this context, Luke is indicating that Jesus was sent by God to lead us from slavery to sin and into the freedom of a new life lived with God that was just beginning to dawn. The three disciples, rooted to the spot with their mouths hanging open, knew that something very big was happening. And they knew that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed that, but here was the proof. And they were so totally overwhelmed by the sight to the point that they were beyond rational thought. And then Peter spoke up. Now, you got to love Peter. You remember several weeks ago when Father Tim was talking about uh, the game that they used to play about which of the disciples you would want to sit next to at the Last Supper? Well, I would always choose Peter because you never know what he's going to say or do next. He reminds me of Miss Prothero, a character in Dylan Thomas's wonderful poem, A Child's Christmas in Wales. On Christmas Eve, 
a small fire broke out in the Prothero's front parlor. The local fire brigade was called out. They put out the fire. They soaked everything in sight. No sooner was the fire out than Miss Prothero, who said the right thing always, came downstairs. She peered at the three firemen in their shiny helmets standing in the smoky wet parlor and asked them, would you like anything to read? Confronted by the dazzling sight of Jesus with Moses and Elijah, the mighty followers of God who represented the law and the prophets, Peter did not have a clue of what to say or do, so he said the first thing that popped into his head. Hey, it's a good thing we're here. How about if we build you some huts? You can hang out for a while. Now, when we first hear that, we think, well, that was dumb. But can you really blame Peter? If this was the dawn of the new age, if this vision was a sign of God's saving activity on behalf of God's people, then why not take the time to just savor the moment and make it last as long as possible? Building temporary huts was something that everyone in Israel did to celebrate the annual festival of the harvest. So Peter figured, yeah, they could whip up three in no time, no big deal. Then everybody could visit, they could relax. They could bask in the glow with the new age dawning. They could prolong the moment and maybe skip or at least delay the hard stuff. The suffering and death that Jesus said was awaiting him in Jerusalem. So no sooner had the words left Peter's mouth than the disciples were enveloped in this big, thick cloud. It just clamped down on them out of nowhere. And as if that wasn't scary enough, there was a voice that came to them out of the cloud and it boomed at them, this is my son, the chosen. Listen to him. Whoa. They knew then that they were in the presence of God and they were terrified. This is not what they expected when they went up the mountain. They were expecting peace and quiet, a little prayer time, maybe a picnic, a nap. The last thing they expected was the sight of Jesus meeting Moses and Elijah, and then they were certainly not expecting a directive from God. This was so overwhelming, so beyond anything that they had ever experienced before that even Peter was finally shocked into silence. And then just like that, it was, it was over. The cloud disappeared. Moses and Elijah were gone. There was just Jesus standing there by himself and it was as though nothing had happened. But something clearly had. Without another word, they picked up their stuff and went back down the mountain. Matthew and Mark tell us that Jesus ordered the disciples not to discuss what they had seen and heard, but Luke doesn't tell us that. He ends this amazing experience by telling us that the disciples kept silent and in those days told no one of any of the things that they had seen or they had heard. Well, why not? Maybe they were afraid that the other disciples would be jealous. Maybe people would think that they were drunk dreaming. Maybe they also realized that they couldn't ignore Jesus' statements about going to Jerusalem to die. God had told them on no uncertain terms to listen to Jesus. In any event, what had taken place on the mountain that day was so 
profound, so beyond their everyday experience that there were no words to describe it. Maybe they just needed time to get their heads around it. So we don't know why the disciples didn't talk about what happened. And it's interesting that right after this, life just seems to go back to the way it had always been. In the verses that follow this passage, Jesus heals people, the disciples have an argument about who is the most important disciple, and then Jesus is still moving closer and closer and closer to Jerusalem and the cross. Back at the end of February in 2020, our family had the privilege of attending the Philadelphia Orchestra premiere of a new work by the American composer Michael Doherty. Now, I have to admit that my musical taste runs to Italian opera and 20th century French and English composers, so I was not quite sure what to expect, but Paul Jacobs was the organist for the concert. So I knew it was gonna be interesting at the very least. So we had a great dinner, we got a chance to visit with Joe, Karen, and Alex Smith, who, was, who were there that evening. It was great, wasn't it? But you know those moments in life when you have an experience that is just so amazing that you cannot find the words to describe it adequately? This concert was that. The music was so powerful so brilliant that it felt as though the gates of heaven had opened a crack and the glory of God was pouring out in a torrent of sound. It was glorious. And as the last note came crashing down on us, the audience rose up with a roar and a thundering ovation. Our experience that evening was so incredible that it was hard to find words to talk about it, although, as the Smiths can attest, I babbled the whole next day about it. You couldn't even really think about it. It was impossible to really describe the impact of that holy shining moment when the gates of heaven opened, everything seemed bright and new, and life was full of hope and promise. Two weeks later, the nation went into lockdown. Almost overnight, because of the pandemic, we were catapulted out of our normal day-to-day -day routines and we were forced to rethink everything that we once took for granted, even simple things like going to the grocery store were suddenly dangerous and scary. And you had to really plan for it. We were in unknown territory then. The future certainly looked bleak. But even in the midst of that, when those bright shining moments, those, those mountaintop moments, when it seemed as though we had caught a glimpse of the glory of heaven, they, they seemed dim and far away, they were still there, still glowing like the embers of a fire. In his beautiful poem, Ode, the 19th century English poet William Wordsworth wrote about when we're children, every day is bright with light and the world around us is suffused with the glory of God and we can see it in everything. And as time goes on, age and life's experiences dim that joyous light. The clouds roll in, the storms of life overtake us. Day-to-day -day life just kind of grinds us down. And the glory of God that we experience in those brief glimpses on the mountaintops of our life just seem dim, like a half-forgotten memory. But those mountaintop moments are not gone. We have seen flashes of the glory of God, and those moments are still there. Wordsworth ends his poem what though the radiance which once was so bright be now forever taken from my sight, though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower, we will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind. Maybe for the disciples, 
that experience on the mountaintop when they witnessed the dawn of the new age of God's involvement with God's people gave them the strength that they needed in the days and weeks that followed. When their brave assertions that they would follow Jesus anywhere failed, Jesus' journey to Jerusalem ended on the cross, it seemed as though their hopes had died too. But somewhere in the midst of all of the sorrow and fear, the bleakness, that sense of failure, there was still a remnant of hope, a fragment of glory that clung to them from the mountaintop. That gave them the faith and the strength to go on. And go on they did to spread the message of God's love throughout the world. And so it is for us. When times are tough, when the realities of life come crashing in on us, we still have our mountaintop experiences. Those times when it does seem as though life is full and rich and just perfect, glowing with the promise of the glory of God. Those moments, as brief as they are, change us. They remind us that there is more to life than drudgery and pain. Our life has purpose and meaning because our life is rooted in the love of God. So cherish those moments, remember them, because even as the glorious light fades and we are once again immersed in the cares and concerns of everyday life, that remembered glimpse of the kingdom of God in all of its glory is still there. And that gives us the strength to go on, to persevere in the faith that one day the gates of heaven will fully open for us, the kingdom of God will be revealed in all of its glory, the light of God's love will envelop us, and we will be welcomed home. Amen. But do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God.
O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, the high and mighty ruler of the universe, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers upon earth, most heartily we beseech thee with thy favor to behold and bless thy servant, the President of the United States, and all others in authority. And so replenish them with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, that they may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. And do them plenteously with heavenly gifts, grant them in health and prosperity long to live, and finally after this life to attain everlasting joy and felicity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and other clergy and upon the congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, whose splendor unfettered, whose mercy unbounded rests upon the wide plain of Nebraska, let the soul of thy people be open too. May they hark thy call gently upon the wind, poignant as a whistle cry haunting the prairie night. Nurture, Lord, the great course of flat water which once bore the questing pioneer across our nation's heart and now dispenses life to the fields of corn and farmers' homes. So may blessing come, O Father, to children schooled to thy glory, whose eyes shall reflect the distant hills of faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men that thou wouldst be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially we pray for thy holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, especially those for whom our prayers are desired. that it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all of their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, Amen. Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, Give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, and has promised through thy well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt be in the midst of them. 
Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all forevermore. Amen. Thank you.